Yeah. Take two, Q Howard. What exactly is great acting, and how can we learn to do it? We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. That's great acting. And great performances, like that one from Peter Finch, for which he won an Oscar, are thrilling to watch. But they can also make it seem as if time has stopped. They can take us on a journey out of ourselves. That's the mark of a great performance and a great actor, right? How do they do it? You and I are setting out to learn that skill and how to take the audience on that journey. With those skills at your command, a director can tell at an audition that you're an actor who has the acting chops and you can make it look easy. But why is it sometimes so hard? And why is living life as an actor so hard? I don't know about you, but I used to think that I was the only struggling actor, I hate that term, who felt petrified and totally unworthy to get up there and do it. If that's your feeling, unfortunately, you may be an artist. But personally, I got trained, I had some successes, some failures, but I found a way to make a career out of it. And I want to take that burning desire within you and set you on a path. Welcome to this introduction to the neuroacting system. I'm Brian Bounds, a professional actor since the age of 21. I'm also a writer, producer, director, and now I'm passing on what I've learned over four decades to young actors. My students get agents, get into the top acting schools, and they get work. This taster is an introduction to The Actor's Way, an online version of a 12-week live course that I teach for new actors. Now, of course, you can't learn the craft of acting by watching videos. So along with nine video lessons, I've put all the exercises from The Actor's Way into a 70-page course book. You'll find this in the description of this video, including worksheets you will use for the rest of your career. I'll make it interactive, passionate, and supportive. Good. Well done. But also honest and direct with no BS. Now this lesson is extremely important before we get to the acting exercises because today we're going to look at the myths of acting. I call them the seven skill killers. These are the problems we actors have that get us stuck. This introduction is going to teach you about the way we act in the industry today. Not the how, but the way we act. The how I cover on the course, because the how of acting has changed over the course of decades. You need to know how it's changed. And the how of how you should be trained as an actor ought to change as well, because you've changed. I've been training actors since 1990. And even before COVID-19, I've seen a progressive change in actors' abilities, because now we have this. Screen time has affected the way we use our minds and our bodies in our acting. In other words, we're smaller as performers. We find it harder to approach a character, and we're less expressive. Put a coronavirus on top of that, and now we actors, the most social of animals, are now socially isolated. So we need to reawaken those social skills, those sensory skills, our imaginations, our focus, our ability to connect deeply with another human being. That is an absolute must in our work, and that's what neuroacting does, and that's why I've created it. But today will be a process of uncovering, discovering, and discarding. As I said, this video will not teach you how to act, but it will teach you where we're all going wrong. And without knowing what's in this video, you'll be like a laptop with a virus. You won't be able to fix yourself, and your acting won't work. You see, before we can learn what acting is, and later in the course learn how to do it, we have to tear down the old ideas of what we thought acting was, so we can replace those old ideas with something more creative. If we hang on to those old ideas, it puts us into fear, insecurity, envy, and competitiveness, and a tight, unresponsive body. This entire course is about finding the solutions to solve your problems. And when you replace those old ways with new ones, You'll be like the actors I train who make casting directors or audition panels at drama school sit up and say, finally, someone who knows how to act. But at this point, I'm going to say to you what I say to all my students. Acting is about connecting. And I want to know that you and I are truly connecting in this moment. So from this moment on, and in each lesson, I want you to start laying down those neural pathways of a quiet, receptive mind. Take a moment right now, switch off your phone or any of the notifications for the rest of the time that you're with me. I need your focus, okay? Pause me if you need to do it.
first, before we look at your job and how you can do it better, we're going to stay here in the audience. I know you don't like it here. I know you want to be up there on stage, but I want you to get hired. So I want you to think of acting from the point of view of someone who's going to hire you. So I ask you, what is going on here? Pretend that you're watching a performance from an actor that really engrossed you. It captivated you. It pulled you in as you watched the character going through the story. What was actually going on with you? Knowing that will make you a better actor and make a director want to say, I want them. As I said at the beginning, great, gritty performances take the audiences on a journey. The brilliant director William Ball summed it up in the following way. Close your eyes for the next seven minutes and just listen and imagine. You have brought me down. When all of the actors believe in what they are doing and all members of the audience believe in what they are witnessing, we have all component parts believing something at the same time. The actors believe one another. Can you not see that I am destroyed how you are? Each actor believes himself. Each spectator believes each actor. And Christ, I will bring you down with me. All component parts are in harmony. When all component parts are in harmony, we have the possibility of a work of art. Stevie? We have unity. Let's draw our attention to the last seven minutes before a three-act play comes to an end. Seven minutes is an arbitrary length of time, but we'll use it to represent an experience that frequently occurs a few minutes before the final curtain. But let's work up to this point from the beginning. The curtain rises. For the first ten minutes, the audience is curious, distracted, detached, and even skeptical. They're thinking, you can't draw me in. I know the scenery's fake. I know the language is artificial. I know I'm holding a program. I know I may have to fight for control of the armrest. I know I just had dinner. I know my objective reactions to what I see. I know it's a story, a fabrication, and I know I'm separated from the action. I don't believe it. What time are they coming? But gradually, curiosity and then belief draw the spectator away from disbelief. And during the process of the first act, moment by moment, you begin to believe what the actor is doing. You're still aware of yourself. Aware of your comfort, aware of your recent past, aware of your critical evaluation of the performance. But once in a while, here and there, you are drawn into the belief that the actors really mean what they are saying. In the second act, belief draws you in further. Your curiosity begins to take over. Your doubt slowly gives way, and you're drawn further into belief. Now and then you find yourself involved for two or three minutes at a time. You find yourself actually captivated by the actors and by what they are saying and doing. For periods of time, you even believe them to be who they say they are. Then toward the end of the second act, you relinquish more control. Without realizing it, you find yourself believing a prolonged passage just before the fall of the second act curtain. During the intermission, you're eager to learn how the third act will be resolved. You return to your seat and hardly 10 or 12 lines of the third act have been spoken before your belief in the action is almost continuous. You believe the actors to be who they say they are, and you believe they mean what they're saying. You believe they are in the trouble they say they are in, and believe that they feel true emotional distress. Relentlessly, your belief draws you further under the spell, and without any noticeable transition, you believe yourself to be the character you are watching. You believe that you are in the same trouble that the actor is in, you believe that you and the actor are one. Now you are drawn into a few moments of what we might call complete absorption, a period of partially unconscious experience. That's a very important characteristic of what we have referred to as the last seven minutes. In fact, for one spectator, it may be only 30 seconds or a minute. And for another, the period of deep absorption may be as long as 20 to 30 minutes. For purposes of discussion, we'll assume the experience lasts an average of seven minutes. Now, to review quickly, the major characteristic of this seven-minute period is that belief has drawn the viewer into complete absorption, an unconscious experience during which you lose track of yourself. You don't know who you are anymore. You have relinquished critical judgment. You have abandoned yourself. You are lost in the play, and your belief systems have conquered you completely. You believe you're in danger, just as the actor is in danger. You believe you need what the actor needs. You hope for what the actor hopes for. There's complete identification between the actor and you. 
You believe yourself to be the actor. You are now in a state of awe at something outside yourself. And what is more, you are not aware that this transaction has taken place. As the final speeches of the play are being spoken, you become dimly aware that the play is drawing to a close. In the last few moments of the play, when the resolution is in sight, your critical faculties gradually return. Slowly you become aware again of your separateness. A sense of relief and satisfaction take over as the curtain falls and you find yourself returning to your individual reality. Only then do you become aware of having had the experience of complete unity. What happened was that through the medium of belief, your consciousness transcended to a state in which you were in complete unity with something outside yourself. During that phase, you were completely unaware of your physical comfort, your future, your past, your problems, your longings. Everything about your life was completely surrendered to an identification with the actor's belief. This experience is rare and special. Most people regard it as enjoyable, healthy, spiritually renewing, even inspiring. And once experienced, most people look forward to doing it again. This transcendence into unity is the mark of a work of art in the theater. The more prolonged the moment of unified belief, the more powerful the work of art. What happened was that an audience of, let's say, 600 spectators was more or less simultaneously drawn into a state of unity consciousness. When one is in this state, one is not aware of the experiencing self. The characteristic of unity consciousness is that one is aware of it only after it has happened. One looks back on it in this way. I don't remember anything specifically about that seven minutes. I don't remember being worried or happy or confused. I don't remember anything except the general feeling of having been absorbed. I didn't know who I was. I lost track of time. I didn't have a care in the world. I was completely in it. I was on the edge of my seat. I was captivated. I was spellbound. One might describe it in all these ways, but the observation one fails to make is, for those few moments, my consciousness transcended to a state of perfect unity. Of course, if a fire alarm sounded during that seven minutes, the spell would be immediately broken. The belief systems would collapse, and unity would give way once again to multiplicity. What we are describing are two different levels of consciousness, the experience of which is the mystery or magic of theater. These moments of unity, in which the audience and the actors are one, are the very purpose and the reward of drama. Theater artists would be appalled to hear such ideas spoken aloud. We are magicians, not psychologists. The actor who always covers his tracks would respond with an offhand remark such as, So you like the show, huh? An actor would never openly admit that a play is an innocent masquerade that uses the power of belief to draw the spectator into a few moments of unity consciousness. And now, slowly open your eyes. As you'll see on the neuroacting course, our brains are actually wired to seek out that experience of unity with other people. Some people find it at a concert, at a football game, riding with a bunch of other bikers, sitting in a church, and some people pay good money to feel that experience in a theater. But most people don't even know they're doing it. Now you do. And if you learn the skills that will create that experience in an audience, no matter what the size, doors will open up for you both in here and out there. We actors are strange creatures. I get my script, I wanna look at my part. Now, neuroacting will give you the skills to get those roles, but I also want you to get on the highway to the soul of the artist within you. Here's a personal story. I wanted to be a star until I was 40. And every time I went to an audition or went on stage, I was cripplingly needy and dependent on the producer, director, or audience. I needed you to validate me as a talented actor. I needed you to laugh at my lines, cry at my tragedies, and applaud me at the end. It's as if I had a performance monkey on my back, jeering me to be louder, faster, funnier. And of course, I sucked. Now, you may not be as needy as I was, but it's time to be bone-crushingly honest. Do you want to be an actor because you want to be a star? That's out of your hands. I've worked with stars, and stardom comes from the gods. It's not always the best place to be. But strangely, the best actors I've worked with are extremely humble. An artist is not a show-off. 
An artist works in service of the storyteller. And having written plays myself, you can rest assured that the writers spent months pulling their guts out to put it on stage. Big stories, huge themes, universal ideas. So you just want to grab your script and start showing off? Unless you're willing to do the work of really learning your craft, you're cheating yourself, the writer, and most of all, the audience. You're wasting their time and robbing them of a life-changing experience. The moment you make that paradigm shift that you are a tool for the storyteller to communicate a story that's bigger than both you or the playwright, that's the moment you begin to become an artist. You're no longer a performer. You're a channel through which the ideas flow. Incidentally, remember when I was so needy? When I made that fundamental perceptual change of my role as an actor, the job started to come in. Was I more talented? Maybe talent comes from a healthy use of our latent energies. But I'm damn sure I was projecting the right collaborative energy to the casting director. If I send out acceptance and love and kindness, I have never seen it fail in any work situation. So if you too have a performance monkey on your back, I suggest you fire him. Now that you know this, you might find it doesn't serve you anymore. Now I'll give you that acting used to be about showing emotions. And sometimes we can still be fooled into thinking that it is. Why? I'll get to that later. But let me give you a tour now of the evolution of acting. You're about to learn what method acting is. It's a very nebulous term, but watching how acting evolved will give you an idea of where you need to be headed if you want to be taken seriously as an actor. But first, we gotta bone up on acting history. Western acting began in ancient Greece, first with one actor, then adding characters, and it was all played out in massive amphitheaters, and all the acoustics were incredible. You couldn't see what was going on. So actors had to present the form, the outward appearance of action and emotion. They had to be big. Throughout the centuries until the 1900s, the acting style was pretty much the same. Then with the birth of psychiatry, we learned that the subconscious mind and knowing about it is essential to understanding conscious thought and behavior, the kind we see on stage. And I cover in the course about the subconscious mind in a very straightforward and very useful way for the actor. So acting slowly moved towards psychological realism, and Konstantin Stanislavski created a system so that actors could behave with the same conscious and subconscious motivations that you and I have. However, the acting still had to be big with all those gas lights. Here's a film clip from the greatest actor in the early 1900s, Sarah Bernhardt. Here she is as Queen Elizabeth I, mourning the loss of her lover. You can almost imagine that kind of acting on a stage, can't you? She thrilled audiences, but critics did note that, although she was entertaining, she was not especially moving. Her performances left critics feeling as if they were being given a demonstration of the inner workings of a Swiss watch. But then, take a look at another actor from the same era, Eleanor Duza. She maintained that the only thing she has to offer as an artist is the revelation of her own soul. Remember that. The only thing I have to offer as an artist is the revelation of my own soul. Do you see how much more natural she is? But acting followed pretty much the same old formula of demonstrating the form, the outward appearance of emotions, and audiences didn't know what they were missing. But in 1936, an actor came along to create a huge spike in the evolution of acting. Here's the setup. We see Hollywood's heartthrob, Clark Gable, get the crap beat out of him in a boxing ring by an Irish fellow who goes to change. Gable's business partners try to talk him out of running for mayor. Here's where early film acting goes modern, as Spencer Tracy, the other boxer, surprises the audience that he's actually a priest. Watch how relaxed he is, how involved he is, how playful he is. This was a complete game changer. Here was an actor who didn't look like he was acting at all. Audiences were astounded. They wanted to see more of him. And he won an Oscar the following year. And another one the next year. How did he do it? Not only did Spencer Tracy have immense powers of focus, but his training by the legendary Charles Gellinger taught him that the character and the actor must always be the same. He used to cajole actors saying, you can't have two brains and one head or you're a monster. 
He also taught that the actor must obey their impulses at any cost. Still in the 1930s in America, there was a hotbed of talent called the Group Theater that gave birth to method acting. Several from this group became acting teachers, but the three we're going to look at are Lee Strasberg, Sanford Meisner, and Stella Adler. Strasberg was an actor who held a tight rein on his emotions, so he developed exercises that would release emotions from the actor's past. Put those into the scene and you'll be fine, he thought. Meisner was a different breed of cat. He was already naturally emotionally sensitive, so he didn't need to dredge up his emotions. So he put his focus on the relationship between the actors. The Meisner actor believes that anything I do is based on my relationship with you in this present moment. If I need to emotionally prepare for a scene, I do it before I come on. And we'll look at many effective neuroacting ways for preparing for a scene in Lesson 8. But Meissner's training leads to an intimacy and a connection which make acting almost improvisational. And here's where neuroacting comes in. It's a system of training that evolved over time from my work with actors as I tried to meet their needs. It's the next step along the way from Stanislavski, Strasberg's method, and Meisner's anti-method. I will teach you, one, how to be intimately connected to your scene partner so that you draw the audience in. Two, I'll teach you how to access your emotions in deeper ways than you ever thought possible and let them go in healthy ways. Three, I'll help you to celebrate and express your unique personal truth, your unique voice. This makes your performance stand out from all the others. Four, I'll teach you how to create a structured acting score so that you can then let that go and give a spontaneous performance that's not only great, but repeatable. And five, I'll give you valuable tools from neuroscience so that you're open and aware, calm but energized, so that you bring more creativity and talent to your auditions and your work, as well as the tools of that other teacher that I mentioned previously, Stella Adler. She was the only method acting teacher taught personally by Stanislavski, and she argued that it was distracting to simultaneously experience the imaginary life of the character and also focus on a personal memory in the actor's mind that had no relevance to the character. Later, she said, you couldn't be on stage thinking of your own personal life. It's just schizophrenic. So Stella taught her students the concept of the doingness of acting to use their imagination to create the circumstances and to observe life so that they could create behavior that would suit the character instead of relying on their own limited experience. Her students included Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro. So when De Niro needed to play a baseball catcher, he took up baseball and chewing tobacco. For a taxi driver, he studied the working habits of cab drivers, all leading to behavior that he could put on camera. So you see, Acting has moved away from showing emotions to showing truthful behavior, and those two are completely different. And actors who still think that acting is about emotions, that if I can just tap into all these emotions within me and throw them at you and the rest will take care of itself? Let me ask you, do you personally like being around people whose motivation it is to show others what they're feeling? Oh, the things I gave up to bring you into this world, or, Nobody likes me. People like that suck the air out of a room because there's no healthy connection between the two of you. They're only connecting with their own insecurities or resentments or self-pity. Then why in the hell do we think acting is about playing emotions? Because we're focusing on the results, the way an audience would. But you can't play emotions. I will show you how you can induce emotions with cutting-edge neuroscientific techniques like ALBA emoting, but you can't just fake them. Audiences are too smart. In this scene, you're saying that in your scene right now, your character is frustrated. Let me give you your line. Okay, say that line out loud right now in a frustrated way. Just do it. Now, I'm sure you're a talented actor, but if you try to be annoyed, most actors show us bad, hammy, over-the-top acting. And you were probably listening to yourself as you said it, right? Dangerous. And if it's not, whose side are you on? Then it's going to be a flat line of simmering, intense emotion that gets boring after 10 seconds. Why? Because you're trying to imitate a human being. As an audience, I want you to be a human being. But you're trying to fake it. I don't want you to fake it. 
as an audience member, I don't care what you're feeling. I want you to be you, and I want to see you struggling. And by doing that, you will be doing something to me in the audience. So what we're really doing in method acting is duplicating what the mind and the body do in daily life. Like what you're doing right now. What are you doing right now? Are you looking at me? Focusing on showing what you're feeling and waiting for your next line? Of course not. Nobody wants to show people what they're feeling or thinking. And believe it or not, it's the same with acting. So we've been circling this concept of the audience and the actor, but what exactly is acting? We better know that if we're going to learn it, right? First, let me ask you, what does good acting look like? I think you'll agree it looks natural, realistic, genuine, sincere, exciting, heartfelt, and moving. And what does bad acting look like? Well, that looks phony, affected, fake, unconvincing, hammy. So why do certain performances look hammy? Here's the cruel paradox of great acting. The more work that's going on in the performance to make it look great, the less you can see of that work going on. In other words, the actor's job is to make it look like there's no work going on at all. The great Spencer Tracy was asked by a young actor for some advice about acting, and he said, never let him catch you at a kid. Okay, but what are these great actors doing, and how can we learn to do it? We'll learn that next, but remember, great art conceals the technique which produces it. What are the three things you need to be an actor? According to director Harold Clerman, an expressive, flexible body, a well-trained voice that people would enjoy listening to, sensitivity, not intellect or talent. So a lot of our work will be about opening up your heart. And fourth, and I've added this beyond Clerman, is a curious mind. The great actors of today are insatiably curious about other people. But if you boil down the technique of what works in the industry today, it's expressed by the American teacher Sanford Meisner, who said acting is living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Now, the imaginary circumstances is easy to get. The actor is on stage or on a film set imagining this fictional world. It's the living truthfully where the technique comes in, and that's the art that you'll learn on this course. Let me introduce you to that art right now by asking, what are you doing this very moment? And you can't say, I'm listening to you. You're actually debating whether to turn me off or struggling not to check your phone or dismissing what I'm saying or savoring these concepts because you've finally found someone who teaches technique or you're planning your next meal. You're evaluating, judging, criticizing, gathering information. I just threw a hell of a lot of verbs at you, but that's what you're doing. You're not just listening. You're doing something to me. Don't dismiss this, because this is the root of acting. And that simplicity makes acting believable. That's what you saw in your favorite character on stage or on screen. That's what drew you in. It's actually simple, but not easy. And if the idea of learning to play actions is boring, then don't be an actor. The industry is not for people who don't want to use their brains. Any professional director will expect you to be able to do this. They're not actually going to direct you. They're focusing on the camera, the lights, the sound. They will expect you to know this. And you're not going to learn it through drama games or improv or doing show after show. It takes learning the craft. Actors are at a disadvantage today because we no longer have repertory companies that will train us in the small parts so we can then move up to the bigger parts. In the past, you wouldn't play Juliet until the theater company that had trained you knew that you could play Juliet. But in the acting world of today, you have to demonstrate that you have the instantaneous ability to grasp and play a character through auditions and self-tapes. You need to learn a rock-solid technique that's in your neural pathways for any audition or performance. Get down! 
I wish it were that easy. You flip a switch, the light bulb goes on, and it will. You learn to act, and you never have to top it up after that. This life will take constant work. And in some ways, you've got it harder than previous generations of actors, because you've got this. And it's designed to captivate you and distract you from honing your craft. You're not even aware of how asleep your senses are. My job is to help you wake up your senses, to shake you out of your sleep, and sometimes shock you into putting you on a digital detox and introduce you to your own soul. All of what I'm going to teach you comes from my own direct experience. There's no one law of acting, but I can only teach you what I've learned and what works with students and gets them agents and work. You will learn tried and tested techniques to understand universal principles. When you understand the principles, you will then create your own technique and you will become an artist with a voice that's not shared by any actor who has ever been or ever will be. And we're going to encounter the first principle of acting when we face the last skill killer. The reality is it's perfectly healthy to feel insecure while acting. But there are ways to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. But there's another problem that needs a solution. Let's say you buy into this crazy idea that I'm a channel for the playwright and what I'm being is basically a facilitator of a spiritual event. But then I go out on stage and there's all these people staring at me. What do I do with my hands? How do I walk? When he says this, I'm supposed to cry at this point and I don't feel anything. And this is a comedy, damn it. Why are they laughing at me? Oh, we're going to look at that problem in great detail. Let's look at it right now with some students. In the first activity, students choose a partner and simply stand facing their partner for one minute. I advise them to create nothing and deny nothing. Just observe your partner for one minute. Then I ask them, how did that feel? Most say weird at the start, but I got used to it after several seconds. In the second activity, I arrange the chairs as if it's a theater audience. I ask for a volunteer. The audience arranges themselves in chairs. Will stands in front of the group for one minute. Again, I say, create nothing, deny nothing, and we'll see how well you do. How do you think you would feel in this situation? Will said he felt petrified, and any person would, no matter how self-confident they might be. The lesson here, being in front of an audience is abnormal. It makes us feel strange, unnatural, and self-conscious. Every actor innately feels unnatural on stage. The ones who don't, who feel absolutely comfortable showing off, are generally blazing extroverts who generally don't have a rich internal life that creates art. So our solution for this problem will be in the rest of this course, where we can learn to be relaxed and unselfconscious. And we will need this. I ask for another volunteer. Alexia joins us, and I give them a task. I say, imagine that you're watching a film with your girlfriend, and your parents are due back at any time. They hate a dirty house, and you don't want them to humiliate you in front of your girlfriend. So, clean up the popcorn. Go. After they clean it up, we talk about it. All right, now, when you were picking up the popcorn, were you focused on the audience? No. No. The object of your attention was the popcorn. All of your attention was focused on the popcorn itself, all right? You understand that? Picking up yeah. the popcorn, you're totally focused on the popcorn, right? Okay, now, are you focused on the popcorn now? <laughs> what are you focused on now? Yeah, because you're talking. Yeah, because the object of your attention has moved to me, all right? The way to living truthfully on stage is to always have an object of your attention and it changes from object to object to object. And the easiest way to have an object that you focus on is the other person that you're on stage with. Because the words just came effortlessly when you were saying. Now here's a question for you. What did I say to them before asking them to pick up the popcorn? Imagine. Imagine. All of these elements, imagination, concentration, having a problem and doing something to overcome it, these are all muscle groups of acting that professionals use. 
and you and I will begin learning them. It's packed with other helpful videos, exercises that you can do on your own, worksheets that you will use throughout your career. It's an acting system in total. And now that we've discovered and hopefully discarded the ideas that keep us locked in fear and at the mercy of our tight physical instrument, I hope I can help set you on the highway to the soul of the artist within you. They, the audience, they need us to be the best artists we can be at this time. We bring them joy, raise their consciousness. We give them that sense of unity that they hunger for. So until then, stay well, stay beautiful, stay true to yourself, and break a leg.